Hello Reddit, this is Max Brooks, and I'm here to answer some of the questions that you emailed me. And the first one is from Ivan Kirigan, and he says, Now that there are hundreds of thousands of zombie aficionados, if not more, how would the story, and the story being World War Z, uh, how would the story have to change to account for this? Well, that's a really good question, and you could go one of two ways. I could change it. Uh, and put it in a world where people don't know about zombies, and I think that would be much more convenient. But the truth is, my stories uh, tend to focus on the fact that people do know there's a crisis and still don't do anything about it, because that's what I really believe. I believe that uh, just because people know that a threat is out there doesn't necessarily mean that um, they're going to do anything to, to protect themselves. Uh, I mean, you look at New Orleans, people knew about water, and they knew the levees were going to fail, and the federal government knew. Uh, I live here in Southern California, and pretty much every couple of years, uh, fires come and just burn away half the hillsides and take away homes, uh, millions of dollars in damage, sometimes people die, every couple of years. And every couple of years, there's always a government official on TV going, boy, we... We weren't ready for this. We had no idea. And sure enough, right after the fires have been extinguished, people move right back into those hills. Uh, so I think that's human nature to, uh, to ignore a crisis. So roundabout way of saying I probably wouldn't change much. Uh, maybe some people who would know might protect themselves, but I think society as a whole, they got better things to do than uh, think about protecting them, you know their lives, their families, uh, their nation. Uh, the second one is from Smartly Pretty, and she says, what's your personal favorite zombie novel and why? And which zombie tropes are most compelling to you? Well, <clears throat> you know, Smartly, the, the thing about zombies now is that there's so much of it out there, but when I started writing, there was nothing. And after I wrote Zombie Survival Guide, I went back and kept trying to search for zombie books. And I found one small one, uh, almost a novella, and it was called Reign of the Dead by Len Barnhart. And that's got to be my favorite, uh, just on principle, because Len wrote it. I call him Len, like I met the guy. Uh, Len Barnhart wrote Reign of the Dead when there was nothing, not even Zombie Survival Guide. I mean nothing. Nobody was writing about zombies. And so clearly the guy did not do it to cash in. The guy did it because he loved zombies, uh, he loved the traditional Romero-style zombie apocalypse, and he wanted to do something about it. And he sat down, wrote a book, got it out there. So I encourage everybody to support him and go out and find uh, Reign of the Dead by Len Barnhart. Uh, this one is by Swordpen. Uh, what's your stance on domesticated zombies? Well, sword, pen, I, I personally would not try to domesticate them, but this is America. Uh, if you feel like this is your personal choice, and when there's hordes of flesh-eating ghouls coming for you, and instead of killing them, you'd like to teach them how to wash dishes or mow the lawn or whatever, you, you do that, and you tell us all how that turns out. Uh, the next question is from Vice Presidente. Uh, if you could choose any five people in the world uh, to be stuck with in the zombie apocalypse, who would it be and why? Well, all right, listen, Vice, um, here's the deal. I try to write realistically. You know, I'm, I'm not sort of going in for, like, you know, cheap shock effect, like, oh, who would I have on my team uh, if I could choose anyone? You know, this isn't like a fantasy football draft, okay? Let's think realistically. All right? Forget fantasy. If there was a real zombie outbreak, who would I want with me? And the truth is, I would want the people that are most important to me. Duh. Okay? So I would want my wife, my little baby son, my dog, my father, and Mr. T. Moving right along. Uh, Virtual Matt writes, Why do you think that, as of late, women seem to be infatuated with vampires, such as Twilight, True Blood, etc.? 
while men seem to be enthralled by zombies. In your mind, what is behind this dichotomy of living dead interest? Well, I actually, I, I think that's a bit of a generalization and I don't like to generalize. I think that there are, uh, there are plenty of women who are into the zombie genre. I've met plenty of them. And they're, they're hardcore, and they're good to go. And I'm sure there are men out there that are into vampires. I haven't met any, but I'm sure they're out there. Uh, there can be some, I guess you can generalize in that there are a percentage of men who are attracted to the zombie mythos. And those are the kind of men who believe, I think really in their heart of hearts, that a zombie outbreak wouldn't be the worst thing. You know, uh, society crumbling, hey, maybe they don't get along well in society anyway. Maybe that's not such a bad thing if society crumbles. And if it does, then they could be the hero. Then they can, they can be armed and dangerous and learn their survival skills, and they can really be the alpha male that they believe that they've always had been, but society has denied them. So yeah, there is a percentage of men, and that's why they're into that. Uh, as far as a percentage of women, I think we have to split that up in two categories. There's the older generation of, of female vampire lovers, and that's that's a sexual thing, all right? They're because those generation of vampires were sleek and sexy. We're talking like Frank Langella, Dracula, and uh, we're talking about Brad Pitt, this vampire. That sex, sleek and sexy. Now there's a whole new generation, and that's the the Twilight generation, and you know, good for them, you know, because their generation of little tween girls who are absolutely terrified of penises. And finally, they have a vampire genre for them. So good for them. They suck their blood, just don't touch their boobies. Twilight. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Now, moving on to Frothy Leet. And Frothy Leet says, have you had any experiences with crazy people obsessed with zombies? Uh, well, uh, and it says, can you ex tell me some anecdotes about it? Well, I, I, I don't know. I think crazy is a relative word because, let's be honest, I am the one who wrote the book. So if people are called crazy because they're obsessed with zombies, who's the crazier? The people who read the book or the guy who actually spent all his free time and wrote it? Uh, but no, I, I've met some people who are really, really into this. And... I've met people who have uh, some of my slogans tattooed on their arms, or uh, the the crossed weapons, you know, the, the the machete and the carbine, right there on the forearm. More than one. Uh, I don't know. I, I think as far as as the most fanatical, there was a guy once who asked me to make a dental impression. Came up with that so dental clay and asked me to bite it. I said, "What are you doing?" He said, well, I, I want to get your teeth. I want to get your teeth marks so that I can tattoo your dental marks, your, your teeth marks, onto my arm, and I can say that Max Brooks bit me. So that, that was a little nuts. But what was crazier, the fact that he asked me that or the fact that I actually did it? Uh, the next question, number six, is from Eclipsed. Uh, were there any characters or stories that didn't make it into the final edit of World War Z? Uh, yeah, oh, there were plenty. Uh, the truth is, when I wrote the first draft, I just let the muse take me. And I didn't write World War Z in order. I wrote it uh, depending on which story sort of spoke to me at the time. I, I went with the passion, so I wrote it all out of order. Uh, then when I went back to do a second draft, I had to put it in order, and that was the hard part. Then I really had to cut some stories. And one of them I'm really sad about. It's called The Great Wall, and it's about a uh, little girl, teenage girl, and she worked um, She worked in a department store, perfumes, things like that. But she finds herself as a refugee in China during the zombie war, and she takes part in the rebuilding of the Great Wall because in the story, China has withdrawn. That's their safe zone is the north. So... They withdraw to the north and they rebuild the Great Wall as their barrier, like our version of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so 
that story I really busted my hump on uh, as far as research goes. I, oh my God, the, the maps and the books, um, trying to figure out this exact spot in China. What did it look like? What did the, that part of the wall look like? How much of it needed to be rebuilt? But the truth is, once it was done and once I looked back as far as the second draft, it didn't fit anymore. Because the story itself, the overall story arc, was sort of building to a crescendo, and it was a speed bump. It, it sort of took the story in a different direction. Uh, and I thought, you know what? It, it doesn't work. And it's probably the best story I wrote, but it just didn't work in the broader scheme, so I had to cut it out. Uh, it's, been, it's been published in some anthologies. It's called Great Wall. Uh, question seven from uh, Raspy Wilhelm Scream. For those of you who don't know Wilhelm Scream, it's the sound effect. And it, it, it is a scream. And it's been used in every horror film. It's been used in Star Wars. Uh, oh God, everywhere. Uh, personally, my favorite, it was used in Them, the old black and white giant ant movie. So Wilhelm Scream, nice reference. Uh, he says, what was it like growing up with Mel Brooks as your father? Wilhelm, what do you, what do you want me to say? All right, you want me to say that uh, he was funny the whole time, really witty. Oh, it was a laugh a minute. Mel Brooks's house. Oh, real funny guy. You know what, Wilhelm, it was really, really hard growing up in his house. Okay. And I'm not talking about the yellings or the beatings, all right? That's everybody's father does that. I'm talking about the times when he would disappear. When he and Carl Reiner would just get on their Harleys and just go. Nobody knew where they went. And then my mother would have to send me out because she was too distraught. She was just rocking back and forth on her bed with, with tranquilizers because she didn't know where he was. And then I would have to go find my dad and Carl or my dad and Carl and, and Dom DeLuise and Gene Wilder, Dick Van Patten, or as we used to call him, old stiletto Dick Van Patten because of the knife he always used to carry. And then I would have to go find them in some motel room and I'd have to clean the puke off my dad and pull the heroin needle out from between his toes and get him home. And sometimes I would have to bring along some help. I'd have to bring along the DeLuise boys or, or Rob Reiner and we'd all have to clean them up. And sometimes we'd have to do worse. Because let me tell you something, raspy Wilhelm scream, it takes a long time to bury a hooker. Is that what you want to hear? That's what it was like growing up with Mel Brooks. <sighs> all right. The next one is by, is by Dabacus. Sorry, it's, that, that was a tough one. He says, how do you feel about pride and prejudice in zombies? Uh, does it cheapen both zombies and Jane Austen? Uh, does zombie overexposure like this inherently demand a zombie uh, backlash? Well, I, I gotta be honest with you, uh, Dabacus, haven't read it. I, I haven't read Pride and Prejudice in Zombies. And the truth is, I, I, so I can't judge it. Maybe it's awesome. It, it's not the kind of zombie story I would go for, but that's my personal taste. You know, that's my cup of tea. Uh, I can tell you that I met Seth Graham Smith, who is actually a very cool dude. Uh, no pretensions. He, very nice, very complimentary. We got along really great. Um, haven't read the book. So when I read it, uh, I'll tell you what I think. Uh, as far as a zombie backlash goes, yeah, I think I think it has to come. I, I don't know if it's going to be a backlash and that people will suddenly turn on zombies, but I think the, the truth is they're really, really popular right now. And everybody's writing a zombie book because they think that's where the money is. And people who ordinarily wouldn't even think of zombies are going there because they're they're following the money trail. And the problem with that is you're getting a lot of really crappy zombie books and movies and video games 
And I'm not saying Pride and Prejudice and Zombies is one of them. Haven't read it. I've seen a few others. Wow. I mean, it should just be called The Search for More Money. The trademark. My dad. Uh, but that's true. Whenever you get people all trying to find the money and they produce less and less good material, people are going to get fed up. People are going to say, oh, zombies? It's gotten really bad. And they're going to move on to another genre where it's people really working hard to do something cool. I have mixed feelings about it because as a writer, uh, the sort of zombie glut that's happening, it, it's great for me. I'm selling more books than I ever deserve to. And when that backlash happens and people stop buying zombie books, I have no right to complain. Like I said, I've sold more books than I ever, ever deserve to. If I never sell another zombie survival guide or World War Z or even recorded attacks, I got no right to complain. It bothers me as a zombie fan because I like good zombie stories. And for me, it's getting harder and harder to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff because I don't have a lot of time. So for me to spend that time to go looking for a zombie book and then to pick it up and find out it's really it's really crappy and it's just a guy looking to make a quick buck, that's upsetting to me. You know, when I started, like I said, Reign of the Dead, Len Barnhart, I picked that up, you could feel the passion in that. And you could feel the passion in early zombie projects because these are people who knew they weren't going to make any money. So they really wanted to do it. And that comes through uh, in anything people do when they're not doing it to be successful, when they're just doing it because they can't not do it. So I'm not feeling a lot of that lately. And what bothers me is somewhere out there, somebody's working on a really good zombie story. And I'm talking much better than World War Z. Right now, somebody is thinking of or making notes for or actually writing the next great zombie novel that is just going to blow World War Z out of the water. People are going to read this and go, oh my God, this, I thought World War Z was good. I'm going to be one of those people. I want to read that. But the problem is that person, once they finish their magnum opus, the zombie genre may have passed away. And they may go to publishers, and publishers may say, you know what, we're done. We're done with zombies. Enough. And that great zombie story may never see the light of day. And that's what upsets me. Nothing else bothers me about a glut or a backlash. It's that the next great zombie masterpiece is going to be crushed when public culture moves on. Uh, next one and the last one. What is in your personal zombie survival kit? Uh, that's a really good question. I can tell you that it really depends on sort of where you live. If you live in Florida, you probably don't need to pack thermal underwear. Uh, if you live up north, uh, you probably don't need as much sunscreen as you probably would if you lived in Florida. I think if you're thinking of a zombie kit, you got to think about sort of what you need for where you are and where you intend to go. But I will tell you this. You will not be shooting the whole time. You will not be chopping the whole time. Uh, but you will be sweating the whole time. And you will need a way to purify water. And that's the most important thing because if you run out of water and you dehydrate, you're going to die a lot faster than if any zombie gets a hold of you. You're going to need a way to purify water. All right? And when I say purify it, I mean so you can drink. It's not enough just to bring water with you. You can't bring enough water with you. You just can't. You're, you're, it's too heavy. You're going to sweat. You're going to dehydrate even more. You need a way to purify a puddle or a toilet or a ditch. Something like that. So it's got to be really good because it's, dehydration will kill you and also drinking unpurified water. Now, I've never seen a zombie movie where somebody drank stagnant water and literally crapped themselves to death, but they will do that in real life. So get yourself a good pump, good water pump, so you can filter out particulate matter and some iodine pills so you can sterilize all the little protozoans and viruses and bacteria that's living in it. Uh, those are the most important things. That's what I got. I have to have it anyway. We, we live in an earthquake zone. 
Uh, but also be very careful. Get a good one, know what you're doing, and most importantly, don't get uh, don't get one of those those ultraviolet pens that you stick in the water because it will purify it like that. But the problem is they break and they need batteries. And that's pretty much that's what you'll need. Uh, so thank you all, uh, thank you all for coming, uh, thank you all for coming, thank you all for tuning in, uh, and that's it. Oh yeah, I mean if you need if you want some other advice to have, I mean there there's some other things you could have like, um, well I mean, yeah is. This, this is a Hawken 50 caliber musket. Uh, this thing is great for hunting bears and buffalo. So if you want to put that in your kit, that might not be a bad thing. Um, oh, also, you might want a, a tomahawk. It's good for, you know, chopping wood. Um, and also, if you meet someone, see this peace pipe and, and make peace with people. So that's important. Also, you're definitely going to need just a good knife, just a realistic knife, a very small, very easy bushcraft knife. Very important. Um, oh, you're going to need one of these too. This is roll up solar panels. Uh, this is very important for uh, just if you need to recharge anything, just in case. It, You're going to need a good pair of binoculars. Make sure they're 10 power. Zoom in, zoom out, always good. And you're going to need a machete, no matter what. Uh, this one has a saw back. I don't, I don't think it's probably the best because you can't go like that to a zombie, but just in case, you need a good saw back machete. Oh, and take some seeds. Very important. If you're going to start a garden, uh, you're going to need that. And you, you know, different kinds. It also depends. Make sure good nutrition. And always a good bottle of rum uh, because you're going to need to sterilize all the time. It can also be a, a cooking fluid. You make fire. And, you know, if you run out of options, this is a good way to go. So there's many things you need. Many things.